pleasure to get this opportunity to speak with Miss Janae Bridges. She's burning up the world with her singing rightfully so and will continue to burn it up. She's just starting. I can't wait to see all of the many fantastic things she is gonna do because she's certainly equipped to deal with what needs to be dealt with out here. I'm gonna ask her a few questions. It's, it's an, an honor to ask it. And I was telling her before, these are questions I really wanna know the answer to. First is, what was the most memorable thing about growing up in your life as a child in your family? Whew. Hello, first of all, I just, <laughs> thank you. that's a beautiful question. And I just wanna say how honored I am to be here with you today. Um, you know, I, I'm actually home right now with my family and we have been doing what we've always done. And that is be amongst each other, listening to music, dancing, laughing and loving on each other. Um, some of my fondest memories growing up were celebrating each other uh, through dance, actually. Mm -hmm. And none of us, you know, are trained dancers, but it is some, it, it's a language that we all connect to. Um, and, and whatever we're going through, you know, my mom, she'll turn on whatever she wants to listen to. The other night was Babyface. Uh -huh. And <laughs> we literally just dance and love on each other. So, for me, you know, I, I realize how blessed and fortunate I am to have had those experiences because um, it's a sense of um, no matter what you're going through, you know, you can always come back to that source of unity. And so really that's the first thing that pops up in my mind. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know that you that you're an athlete, you played ball, you ran track. Let's just start with track. What what event did you did you participate in and why? I ran the hurdles, the 100 oh. hurdles, 100 meter hurdles, and in high school it was the 300 meter hurdles. Ooh. And so I I you know, I tried out all of the the different events mm -hmm. and I connected with the hurdles because it was extremely challenging. And I've always loved a challenge. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's ultimately, I think, why I chose the hurdles. I would fall, get back up, fall again, get back up. What relationship did that have to your position in basketball? What position did you play? Mm. Well, I was a point guard sometimes, but mostly a shooting guard. Mm -hmm. I was mostly a shooting guard. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and I will also say that with, with both of the sports, sports in general, I mean, whether it be a team sport or individual sport, Tra track was, you know, kind of a bit of both because you're individually running your race, but at the end of the day, you want your whole team to get the most points. Mm -hmm. But I see it um, very similarly to, to how I sing. It's just like, yes, I'm on this stage with everybody, the conductor, the orchestra, um, and everybody who is involved in the production, but I need to make sure that my technique is on point and that I am able to hit this note and sing this melisba. Mm -hmm. So there, there's so many parallels mm -hmm. that I often reference back to. Right. Did you find a similarity? Because it, it, you, you were very good at it, it's difficult. So could you apply the discipline and the kind of understanding of the techniques that you had playing sports? Could you apply that to the various techniques you had to master as a singer? Absolutely. And I just want to say that you talking all this technical basketball talk, we have to play one day. <laughs> we have to play. Okay. We have to shoot around. Hey, look, I only talk now. <laughs> you missed me. I'm too old to get out there now. I just talk about what I did. I want to get on that stage and not have to think technically. I want to make right. music and, and be an artist and, and sing with my heart and soul. So, so many hours in the gym, you know, before I remember before class started and I think class started at 8 a.m. So I was in the gym at five or six and then, um, you know, going through school, doing my extracurricular activities, then going back to the gym. It's very similar. You know, there's so many hours that I put into the practice room when I'm learning an opera mm -hmm. and, and even leading up to learning a score, you know, I don't just dive in and start learning. It's like, I got to warm up. I have to look through the score. I have to see what I'm working with. And, um, sometimes I even take it from the end to the beginning, like depending on what I know my body right. needs and, and my vocal cords <laughs> need, you know? So, right, um, right. it is, it's very methodical and 
technical and takes a lot of time. <laughs> I was always fascinated with singers about about breathing. That's also similar to, to athletics because breath is energy. And mm -hmm. as a trumpet player, of course, you know, we breathe all the time. And I, we were always told to study singers when we breathe. So I just want to get a sense of your philosophy about breathing. Mm. Yeah, that's a, it's a great topic. Um, it's so interesting because I feel like really in the last couple of years, I've gotten a good underst uh, uh, an understanding of my breathing and how it works um, best for me. Right. And it actually just took me <laughs> tuning out what everyone else told me and figuring it out for myself. Right. And I'm just That'd like, oh my gosh, like, why didn't somebody just tell me this? But mm -hmm. I, I've had amazing teachers uh, and amazing coaches and collaborators. Um, but at the end of the day, I realized for me that my body is different than everyone else's. I mean, we're all so individual. So, I mean, I'll just say like, I have a smaller rib cage. And so mm -hmm. I was trying to breathe in a way that like a big baritone would breathe, which is typically more like, um, I, I don't know how to say this. Push the diaphragm down. Yeah, the yes, yes. And and for me, it just also being, having been an athlete, like it's, it's a breathing that it does push out, but this expands like here. Right. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, right? So you I lift it up a little bit, right? Yes, so I was focusing more on expanding my stomach, but it, that's not how it works for me. And so right, I just right. kind of had to go yeah. through trial and error. Mm -hmm. And I remember just feeling like I could run, run, run the race again. Right. And so um, that's what I feel, you know, with singing. The last role that I did was actually in Washington, D.C., um, Samson and Delilah. And it is it is a big role. Like <laughs> this woman does not shut up. And I love it. <laughs> I, I love the role so much. Um, but I was like, when I looked at the score, I thought, how am I going to get through this? Like, she doesn't stop singing. Um, and that's really when I've truly found my breath mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and how to ride it and the energy that you were talking about, how to how to use it to best um, get through the role, you know, and efficiently, really. Who were the first people you heard that made you think opera exists and maybe I could do this and, and why? That's an amazing question <laughs> because, yeah, Seattle is not really the hotbed so much. But um, I, I have to say, I didn't really listen to opera until I was like 17. So <laughs> I, I was kind of, I was a latecomer. Um, yeah, I understand. For, you know, so I grew up with Motown and um, mostly Motown actually and, and, and jazz and R&B. Um, so some of my earliest like singers outside of opera were, were, were not operatic that I really admired. However, when I did catch the bug of opera singing, um, I heard Kathleen Battle. And I was just like, first of all, what is this sound? Because it, it it's just so divine. And it's, it caught my attention in a way that no other voice did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I don't think I could really articulate it back then, but what I was feeling was um, just like the purity and, and the honesty in her voice, mm -hmm. you know? So that Kathleen Battle was really one of the first, the first voice, I will say, classical voice that um, I heard and it captured me and it made me want to know more about opera. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so then I, I did, you know, I went down the rabbit hole and I went down the rabbit hole with African-American singers, particularly because I just didn't even know that was a thing. I, right. I didn't, right. I really wasn't aware of opera like that. I mean, it just seemed right. so distant and far away yeah. and it was something yeah. that was not for me. Mm -hmm. So when I heard and saw her, I was just like, oh my gosh. Um, and then Jesse Norman was mm -hmm. another voice and her presence. I was just like, this woman looks like she's like 15 feet because her, her presence is just so magnificent, <laughs> magnanimous, everything. Right. Um, 
and Pavarotti. I heard uh -huh. his voice too, and I was just, you know, it, it's just it, unmatched. Um, so those are some of, I could keep going forever. When, when you were listening to the singers, did you did you get different things from different ones? Like, could you take give me a roll call or maybe say, I wanted to sing X like this and X like that and blah, 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 and start to compile kind of components of a style from the things you liked? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So you mentioned Florence Quivar and she is, I, I hate to name <laughs> favorites, but she is my favorite mezzo of all yeah. time. Yeah, she's heavy. She's very heavy, <laughs> but also very light at the same time. Right, you know, right. like I don't, when I listen to her, I'm just like, I have no worries. Like you don't make me nervous. <laughs> you know, there's some singers where I'm just like, uh oh, but um, the, the depth of her sound and of her soul in every note, you know, hearing her, whenever I learn and sing a spiritual, I, I, I try to channel her because yeah. To me, there's there's no one that goes deeper. Yeah. Um, so yes, like spirituals, I think of Florence Quivar and, and I think of her tone and flexibility mm -hmm. in her voice. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Battle, of course, flexibility and also just like the, the clarity, you know? Right. She's, it's just so meticulous. And I don't think she ever sang a flat note in her life. Um, <laughs> See, look, she's very meticulous. I'm gonna tell yes. you this. Yes, yes. She, she works hard, hard, hard. <laughs> I know, and I just I hear that, and it inspires me to work hard. I noticed Kathleen Battle had a lot of check downs when we were recording. Like she's checking for notes and diction, and and then it's all things about language and meaning, and then musical things. Do you have a check down when you're preparing something? And do you have a way that you're you're assessing your performance? Absolutely, I do. So, I mean, firstly, I need to know what I'm saying. We sing in a million different languages. And like Jesse Norman said, she, she didn't sing in a language that she wasn't fluent in. So that's the ultimate goal. Um, you know, so as a classical singer, it, it is just a lot, but the languages are so important because if you don't know what you're saying, then how can the audience actually believe you? And, and how can you believe yourself you know so that's the first thing um and, and also when you're going to these other countries and singing in their language they can spot you out from a million miles away if you don't sound authentic the composer writes the notes on a page yes anyone can play them but how can we make them come alive mm -hmm. and i think what's tricky about um interpretation in general of music is it's so subjective you know mm -hmm. someone might love the way you did a phrase and someone might hate it. That's actually okay. And, and it's good and makes you who you are and right. you find your voice. So I do feel like, and I battle with this, that there are sometimes too many uh, constrictions and right. it's just like, okay, how do I, Janae, speak and sing and, and, and um, interpret without forsaking what the composer has written and and what the conductor hears and envisions. So it's it's interesting, you know. There's and and what I've come to conclude is that there is no wrong answer. I, I truly believe that, and I often get into discussions about this because it's music. How can there be a right answer? I mean, no. you know, or a wrong answer. And that's what I love so much about jazz. I'm always like, I, I do a little bit, I dabble some with some of my jazz friends and they're just like, just do it. Just let go. It's okay. It's not wrong. And I'm like, but yes, it is. <laughs> I know you, you said you got into the music when you were 17. You said you started listening to it, but you went to the Manhattan School of Music and then you went to Curtis. Now it's hard to get into those schools. It's not, so somebody's 17, now at 18, 19, they're in a conservatory that people are auditioning to get in, get into. What did you do to become that much better in such a short time? Mm. Well, as far as being accepted into Manhattan School of Music, I literally feel that was nothing but God because <laughs> I, 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 had, I didn't know what I was doing, really. I have a very good ear. So I was emul emulating and... and, and um, sorry, imitate, I was imitating and, you know, doing what I thought 
was the right thing. And I did have a, a vocal teacher um, towards the, the beginning of my last year of high school, my senior year. And mm -hmm. so we sang, you know, some art songs in English, and then I moved on to Italian. But um, so I really just feel like I was destined to be there because that faculty heard a lot of potential. I wasn't that good, but they, they heard and I think they felt something. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got there, the competitive um, spirit in me came out and I did not like being the lowest in my class. You know, <laughs> I was just like, oh no, this is, this is not gonna work. So I just, I, I worked very hard. I grinded, I was, I didn't have any money, but somehow I was in the nosebleeds of the Met every chance I could get. I was in Carnegie every recite every recital and um, concert, and not just classical. I I just wanted to like infuse myself with the music in New York, and you know New York was my playground. So by the end of uh, my time at MSM, I graduated with the highest honors. I remember they chose me to sing at the uh, the graduation, and wow. that that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. My parents were just like, I don't know how she did this but they uh -huh. supported me, which I'm so grateful for. Mm -hmm. And when I got into Curtis, um, I auditioned there. I didn't even know what Curtis was, but mm -hmm. I, I was admitted into Curtis because my teacher told me that I couldn't be. So I said, well, I'm gonna audition anyways. <laughs> the, comp the competition came out. Yeah, and um, so I auditioned and I got in. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment where I really you know, felt okay. I, I can do this, I should do this, I want to do this. And um, it really felt like it chose me rather than me choosing it. What is What did you find to be the difference between a mezzo-soprano and a soprano? Because you said you sing high too. So <laughs> what, is that just your personality? Wow. So I, I'll say that I actually started my training at um, MSM with no voice type in mind. My voice teacher trained me as a singer and we were just figuring out what my voice was. And mm -hmm. so I remember singing art songs in the low key, in the middle key, in the high key. And I did that straight for two years. I didn't sing an aria until my junior, my third year in college. Um, mm -hmm. So we just let my voice do what it did. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And ultimately I did choose, I will say, to become a mezzo because I loved uh, the repertoire and I, I feel, <laughs> I, I just connected with the repertoire. How did you find your place in the overall tradition of all the sopranos? Yes, well, I mean, there are so many singers that inspired me. And I, I, I remember hearing um, a Russian mezzo-soprano, Elena Obratsova, hearing her and saying, I wanna sound like that. And I mm -hmm. want that intensity, <laughs> but as much as I tried, like my voice is, it's just not that. Um, mm -hmm. However, I've recognized, and I think the first step in finding my place, I, I'll say that I, I haven't tried to find my place. Like I, I'm just who I am, but right. um, I will say that I am really drawn more towards the, the darker sounds, but the darker sounds that are, clear you know and right, so right. Shirley Verrett for instance right. is a sound that I'm just like oh my gosh like I just melt when I hear her right. and our voices are different but in some ways they are very similar and mm -hmm. so embracing embracing my sound you know um which is it's not Joyce DiGiannato it's not uh Cecilia Bartoli and I love them so much I I mm -hmm. wish that I had that flexibility I do mm -hmm. and I I work on it but um Embracing my sound, which is unique to me, you know, it's, you could say it's a combination of Florence Quivar, Jesse Norman. Um, I, I don't, sometimes people mistake me, sometimes, not mistake me, but they say that I um, compliment Marilyn Horn sometimes too. So I am a mm -hmm. mezzo. Um, right. But then when I sing hi, it's just like, oh, wow, you sound like a young Jesse or um, mm -hmm. Shirley Verrett. So it's, you know, I, I honor all of those women right, right. so deeply. Um, and with that, I honor myself and, and my voice and what God has right. uh, blessed me with. So, you know, 
I don't find right. my place. I, I just am. And I'm so grateful that I am amongst and in conversation amongst all of these change makers and, and greats. Uh, I, want, I want to pick up on something that you said uh, when you were talking about your, your, you grew up in a house and y'all were listening to Motown. So I want to know about who were you listening to? Definitely Marvin Gaye. Well, come on. <laughs> you can't. Marvin. I'm just he like, can't. oh, that man. Yeah, he's the phrasing, you know? Oh, the phrasing. Al Green, his voice, I mean, <laughs> the sound of that voice, it was just like, he, you could tell that he, he went through some things and <laughs> he sang through whatever that was. Mm -hmm. Well, this isn't Motown, this is disco, but my mom would often play to get us out of the bed because it's so gray here in Seattle, um, Donna Sumner. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, uh -huh. I, I, I really, whenever I'm feeling down or, and even when I, um, you know, get ready for opera sometimes, uh, uh -huh. I put on Donna Sumner. Uh -huh. um, this isn't Motown. I'm sorry, but the, these are people just popping up in my mind is Nina Simone. Um, my, my parents played yeah. her. They oh, played her a lot. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah I, I just, I remember her. Well, what you... Now you got a whole different complexion and vibration when you said Nina Simone's name. Okay. Oh, you wow. smiley said uh oh, Nina Simone. It reminds <laughs> me of how Miles and all of them would do when they said Thelonious Monk's name. You could be Ooh. talking to Dizzy, they'd be laughing. What about Monk? Dizzy? Oh, Monk. So what what is it that made you get that your made your, your countenance change? Well, you know, she was a classical pianist and uh she was not accepted into Curtis because she was black. Okay. So I didn't know any of this information, you know, when, when we grew up, grew up on her, mm -hmm. but I knew that this woman was deep and I could hear it. You know, I could hear the pain. I could hear the sorrow. I could hear even the joy, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it was, and I, and I have to actually say that for me, particularly like that her actual, <laughs> this might be like blasphemy, but her actual voice, the sound of it is like not my favorite. <laughs> I understand. But yeah, it's just down home. <laughs> yeah, but what she did with it, like it didn't matter, you know? It was just like this is this is music, you know. This I, I feel her soul. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think that's what you just saw. <laughs> right, when I, right. I love that. Mm -hmm. So can you can you tell me about I know you spent time uh, at the Lyric Opera of Chicago with my good friend, Renee Fleming. So, yes, you know, everybody has to have a person kind of, uh, 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 older than them in the business that looks at them and gives them that, that kind of a certain type of validation and say, yeah, you know, you handle your business and gives you that opportunity. And that's always special. So when I was a young artist at the Lyric Opera of Chicago, uh, it, was, it was more of an extension, you know, I consider it an extension of my education. So, when she was um, uh, positioned as the artistic uh, consultant, I just thought, oh my gosh, like what a luxury for everybody in this, in this place right now. Um, so, you know, one of our first meetings, she, she met with a young artist and she said to us, I'm here for you, whatever you need, if you ever have any questions. And I thought, is she serious? And I don't think many of us really believed her just because of her status. We, we were just so shocked that she was so personable. Mm -hmm. And it, it means so much to have her, um, her support and her, um, her, her in my corner, you know, and I can, right. I, can, I can send her a message and say, you know, I really need help with anything. The career is just difficult. And so when you have that um, assurance from someone right. that you really respect and admire, it it does something. And for me, that something is, it just helps me keep going and, and right. um, reassures the, what I know already and that's that I can do this. Right. So I, I love what you're saying. So I want to just ask you, because now, I mean, at this point, you've, you've premiered roles, like you premiered the role of Josepha in, uh, in, in the, Oh, right. Like you the did girls your the research. Girls the <laughs> no, come on. I, I get on. I, I look at stuff too, though. I mean, I listen wow, to. It. I don't, I like I don't just want to read something. I want to hear what people are doing. And mm -hmm. the girls of the Golden West. Okay, yes. I know. What is the difference between preparing for something that has not been done, 
and doing a role like Carmen that has been done a million times and there's a, a, a set, set way to do it. How do you approach these, these two different ways of uh, dealing with a production? Wow, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I have to say that I ch I've changed my approach. So what I used to do <laughs> with learning more of the, um, you know, the popular, um, more traditional works is listen to recordings, you know, see what I like, see what I don't like, see what I want to do, what I don't want to do based off of recordings. I don't really do that anymore. I, I find my own voice with it. Mm -hmm. And um, with new works, you know, it's like permission to just do whatever you want, you know, and come <laughs> in that first rehearsal, like, this is what I want to do. And then the conductor's like, oh, no, that doesn't work. So scratch all that. But, you know, it's, with new works, works that have never been done, premieres, and, and with composers that are alive, it's like you're creating something that is really unique and honest to you, mm -hmm. to, to, to me. Um, and so there's, there's more of a liberty, there's more liberties that you can take. Um, mm -hmm. And with traditional works, I will say there are less liberties that you can take just because of the tradition and people have in their minds, this is the way this is supposed to go. Mm -hmm. You know, Carmen can't uh, yell tien after, you know, when she's throwing the ring at Jose or she can't sing it. She has to do it this way. Yes, the traditions are there, but like, like I said, now I approach it in a way that is informed, but it's, you're gonna know who I am, you know, it's me. You know, sometimes I would hear people say they're, they're too young to sing a certain role. Yes. So I would wonder about the hierarchy of roles. Like, is there certain roles you have to be a certain age to sing or? That's another yeah. mystery for us trumpet players. You don't get, I have to be 50 to play this. No, <laughs> if I can make it through it, I can play it. I could be six. Yeah, so the voice is an ever evolving mechanism. I mean, when you hear babies, they, they have these very high pitch sounds. When you hear older people, they're maybe sometimes pitched, but usually high pitch, but usually deeper and, and um, slower. And so your voice is always maturing. So mm. there are simply roles that are just too demanding. For instance, for me right now, for instance, the role of um, Amneris and Aida. Mm -hmm. It's extremely demanding in that um, she sings, the orchestra is huge, you know, and she sings a lot in the middle and low, lower register of her voice. Um, but you have to be heard over that orchestra. And I've been asked to sing Amneris a couple times and I've said no, because I'm, I know that I'm not ready. There's so many other roles that will prepare me for that mm -hmm. along with life and, and um, maturity. So it, it is a thing. And I think that, you know, you have to be really smart about that from a technical side. I could probably, I could sing the role for sure. I've been through um, some life experiences where I can identify with that character and I can go there, but mm -hmm. vocally is, is, I'm not ready. And mm -hmm. so to be um, honest about that and have people in your corner that you trust saying you are not ready. You're simply just not is super important because um, sometimes, you know, people get, we get ahead of ourselves and we just are so <laughs> eager to, to want to do this. And, you know, maybe in a couple of years, I will sing Amneris in a smaller house, try it out, you know, mm -hmm. get, get uh, myself around it and, and then go from there. But it is definitely, it's a process. It's a lifelong process. Do you believe that a black person should only play black roles or they should not play roles that were meant for white people and a white person should never play a black role. What is your, what is your basic philosophy about uh, this segregation of roles by color? Yeah, the segregation of roles by color is absolutely absurd. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we are actors and actresses. This is theater, you know? It's not even, it's not even the movie screen, you know, where they have to, uh, play biopics and stuff like that. This is theater. And so the most beautiful thing about being a human, in my opinion, is our imagination. And so when I walk into a theater and I see an opera, I just want to be taken away. Right. And if the color of somebody's skin takes distracts you, 
you need to look in the mirror and, and ask yourself why, because it has right. nothing to do with, uh, you know, what we've spent so many hours, blood, sweat, and tears on, um, and, and what this composer and librettist is talking about. And, you know, there, there are some operas that I've done where it's just like, you know, black as night, and they do refer to, you know, blackness and darkness in a negative way, even associating it with black people. That was for the time, that was the times that they were in. And, right. um, you know, you could argue that times haven't changed, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, art is, it's just such a beautiful outlet. And I think that once people can get out of their own way with this whole race thing that is just absolutely ridiculous, you know, we can truly start to appreciate it. So I think I, I don't mind seeing a white Otello. I don't mind seeing an Asian Aida. I mean, mm -hmm. I, if you're distracted by that, that, that says a lot about right. you. Yeah, I you understand know. what you're saying. And I also understand that you're not saying that racism is not real. Because, Absolutely. Because, racism you know, is very real. Right. So, you know, and, the, you know, I'll just say quickly with the racism piece, I've experienced plenty of it, you know, being black in this country and in this world, you do. But it's, um, I approach it in a way, and I'm grateful to my parents for this. Um, it's just like, I'm not taking that on because it's not right. my problem. Like you need to heal right. yourself and then come back to me or don't. But I'm mm -hmm. gonna do um, what I do and that's make art. And I can probably guarantee you by the end of it, you're going to either not notice my brown skin as, you know, or not associate it with like some negative feelings. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's what music is and in, in art. It has nothing to do with skin color or sex or race or. Right. Right. It's all that. right. I, I, gotta, I gotta hold myself back from talking about it. So let's, now we're gonna, I want to ask you one one final question, and it is a. Uh, you grew up, and you you know you you saw yourself. You heard the opera music. Maybe I could do that. You went through all the things that you went through. You've had a, 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 a arduous journey. You had to have a lot of personal discipline, and you've developed and gotten to the point where you you have a fantastic career. But you're on the precipice of making tremendous changes out here. Just for whatever you decide to do, you have a great opinions. You well, you you you. You're read and studied and you have the courage to speak your voice, all the kind of things a person wants to have. So what is it that you see in yourself right now in the midst of COVID and all the different changes that are that we are suffering from? What do you see in yourself in this moment that 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 you that you rely on and that you will see will lead you into a, a positive future that you also saw in yourself as a child? Mm, wow. That's beautiful. Um so for me in this moment, with everything that's going on, that feels very personal, actually, um, what is getting me through it is, <laughs> ultimately, my, the love for myself that I have. Mm -hmm. And that has obviously grown um, as I've experience life and, exp uh, um, you know, different relationships and everything. But I've always loved myself and I'm grateful to my parents for instilling that, you know, I saw them loving on each other and, and loving on us hard. So it's just like, we didn't have a choice but to love on ourselves. And right. so whenever I'm feeling like defeated or I can't do this, it's just like a lot of self-talking to myself, um, <laughs> right. you know, a lot of self-talk right. Right. and that really is getting me through. And, and something that I always say is that I love myself and um, I want this, like I, I actually want this for my life. You know, mm -hmm. it's not even something that I chose, it chose me. Mm -hmm. So I've always been the type of person, I'm kind of a free spirit in that I, I, I'm intentional, but at the same time, I'm, I'm pretty open to like mm -hmm. uh, receiving just whatever different experiences. And having been open to receiving classical music and opera because of the way that it made me feel. And I understand it's important for that message to be out here too. Because there's so much depression in this time. There's so much 
mental illness and so many things that happen mm. to us happen because we don't love ourselves and we're constantly looking to be validated outside of ourselves. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, you, you're a master articulator. Yes. Um, and so that's what I feel. And I'm, I'm not going to say that it's easy, you know, like some days I'm just like, I'm, I can't do this. It's too mm-hmm. much, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but then I go back to, I love this and, and I love me, you know, mm-hmm. and this, this is a part of me. Um, right. But being able to just tune out, you know, all of the external mess, it comes with its challenges, but it's, it's not it'll never be enough to take away the love that I have for, for this gift and myself. Mm, I love that. So I I thank you for the time that you spent with us. It's been fantastic. I've learned a lot and I look forward to hearing you when we're back again live. I'm going to definitely be there with my, my program for you to give me an autograph. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes, this ma'am. is such an honor for me. I appreciate you and admire you and respect you so very much. And I hope that we can do this again. Mm-hmm.